and we're live. Okay, how are you? I'm doing well, my brother. How are you? I'm doing great as well. It's a uh, seven. Oh, it's eight in the morning here. So just enjoying my coffee and now doing this. Um. So tell me, you, you had an interesting start in life. You you went to college, and you, you graduated college, but then you changed things up. Like, how was life back then? I changed things up before we got to that point. Um, my mother was actually the first one to finish college in our family. Mm -hmm. So I had a good example coming from Poland. I was actually born in Europe. And at the age of eight, right after 9-11 happened, my mother ended up getting a divorce from my father. He, he, he wasn't uh, really around at the time. And she ended up getting a divorce and just kind of taking off, leaving everything behind to move to the States for a better opportunity, especially for me. And once we arrived, she kind of took her education as a, she was a teacher. She put a really good work ethic in that, you know, many of uh, us European uh, nations do have uh, and, mm -hmm. and saw the opportunity in the United States. And she, she wanted to make sure that I had the same education. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of went through the system. I ended up dropping out halfway through. I had a fight at Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. I was training maybe for two years at the time. It was a fight I was set up to lose. Um, I was about six or seven and two at the time. I fought a fighter named Jason Van Oijen from the Netherlands. He was a professional there, turned to amateur once he came to the States. He was an undefeated <laughs> fighter. I realized my true potential at that point, and, and mm -hmm. I was doing something that was once a hobby. And, and the hobby, I think that night when I fought at Madison Square Garden, became something that I am now chasing probably for the rest of my life, I think is going to be a part of me for the rest mm -hmm. of my life, whether it is as a fighter or a trainer. Um, yeah, it's going to stick around and be, a, it's definitely taking a part of my soul. Mm. So how did your family react to the, the sudden change? As, as with most things and people chasing dreams that are out of the society's blueprint, there comes worry. Um, mm -hmm. I think they had some security in the fact that they knew I'm a rather intelligent person and I would hopefully take that with me when it comes to a, a sport such as Muay Thai, though a lot of people think that it is something that's uh, based on brute athleticism, aggression, mm -hmm. things like that. I I actually believe that it is, you know, half of the game is mental, it is intellectual and as you can see now, it is becoming more and more of a business. So I think it, it's becoming more and more critical that you are an intelligent person in this game. Mm. So the transition was definitely tough. My mother was an instructor. And then when she came to the States, you know, she cleaned houses. She worked, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week just to scrape by and eventually became a clinical instructor at mm -hmm. Goodwin College here in Connecticut. So it was education was very important in our family mm -hmm. and just to make them happy i still graduated though i switched my major to health and exercise science something that i was more passionate about something that i was mm -hmm. uh that was more closely related to what i was doing what my passions mm -hmm. were and i kind of fused the two together um, mm -hmm. i graduated first in class and then i never even went to pick up my diploma <laughs> so it's a fun little fact <laughs> Yeah, it was about a year, about a year and a half later that I realized I never picked my diploma up. The, I, I called the school to get a to get a copy of it. There were some issues with uh, we're settling some things from back in Europe, and I, I needed to prove my just pretty much my identity and showing my diploma that I finished college. And they told me that I never graduated. I was like, well, I walked and I got first in class and I got honors and I got golden cords and I did the whole ceremony. And they're like, oh, you're missing this credit. It just so happened that one of the heads of the department, um, that once they switched, they missed some information. So mm. I ended up getting my diploma a year and a half later. <laughs> <laughs> so no graduation party? Man, uh, it, it's funny. A lot of things that you, you want to party and celebrate about, it's, it's, it's something that I, 
it's a good and a bad thing maybe about my personality but but once it happens uh, I, I already saw it as a part of the process as a step mm-hmm. in the process it's not you know the final goal so mm-hmm. I just kind of blast past it and look at the next challenge ahead so no no graduation party yeah more seeing it like oh this is fun i I have it now but i'm looking ahead like what's coming next it was yeah it was never really a goal of mine it was it was a goal i was fulfilling for someone else you know i was fulfilling that Mm -hmm. goal for my family to to enrich their happiness versus enriching my own happiness i had my own goals in mind so i finished that and and that was more of a uh peace of heart and and just seeing my mother smile and and then from there on out you know i pretty much try to prove to my family you know i i did everything i can for you guys i'm, I'm showing you that i love you that i'm a dedicated disciplined person and now i'm going to do my own thing mm. we should have done this podcast before i dropped out <laughs> oh, some people weren't happy yeah. with that <laughs> And um, so obviously the change of the year is like, how did your environment react to the, the, the mental change? Because like, there's a, there's a lot of stress that comes with it. Like friends say you, you've changed and they mean it in like a disrespectful way, but actually it's a good thing. Well, in your case, of course. I think my personality has always been very blunt and straightforward. So it, mm. I think it helps in this case. I think it helps in a lot of cases where there's change to be had, when mm. you know that you need to move forward, when you have more of a blunt up, upfront personality, you know, sometimes people can take it the wrong way, but also people always know, you know, what you're about. I, I, I never sad explaining things that I'm going to do without actually doing them. So then people question whether I'm going to do them or not. I would just do them. And then they would mm. pretty much see whatever the process is or the result of the process. Mm. And and then either stay to tag along, you know, to whether it is to keep up or to still be friends, maybe align themselves in different ways. Mm. Or unfortunately, they would fall off from my life. So you know, things like that happened, uh, you know, early on when I was getting out of high school, when it came to relationships, when it came to a lot, uh, pretty much, I can't think of a single person that I'm really friends with from my high school days, from my college days that I still really keep close touch with besides uh, the person that got me into martial arts himself is mm. someone It was a good friend of mine from middle school going into high school. He was one of the only guys doing martial arts. And, you know, back in middle school, UFC wasn't a thing. MMA wasn't a big thing. Kickboxing, Mm -hmm. Muay Thai, these weren't things that were really known. So Mm -hmm. him doing it, people kind of looked at him like a loser. Like, they're like, oh, you Mm -hmm. like the, like, anime and martial arts and Bruce Lee, you -hmm. know, while they're playing football and doing you know, the sports that are more on the collegiate level, things like Mm -hmm. that. So... Um, I was more interested in that, and yeah, he, he's pretty much the only person that uh, I keep tabs with when it comes to people from my past. Mm. So, and, and are there people who, who reach out to you right now, now that you're growing, getting more popular? From the past, yes, of course. Um, you know, we... I'll, I'll talk to people. There are a lot of people actually stopping through Thailand on their mm. travels i think a lot of more a lot more people are getting to see the beauty that's around the world that's one of the pluses of social media is just to be able to see that there's more out there than you know where we're mm. living so uh, a lot of people are reaching out about exploring thailand and things like that and you know there's pros and cons to that as well there's only so much time in the day and i try to make time and see as many people as possible but the people that are really close to me they're they're the ones that have been on this journey um, either since the beginning or they've just kind of shown, um, you know, their love for it themselves. I, I tend to just kind of s- socialize myself and, and surround myself with people that, you know, are also have goals, people that inspire mm-hmm. me as well. Mm-hmm. So, so that way we can kind of work on each other's rhythm and flow mm-hmm. and inspire each other. Mm-hmm. Do they have to be similar goals or do they just have to set goals in general? Just in general, um, Mm. you know, I learn a lot from people, whether um, it be business, they're in a different kind of lane. It could be a different sport, a different lane altogether in life. Mm. 
and I try to take inspiration whoever, from whoever it may be. And that's mm. one of the beautiful things about me living in Thailand now, recently moving uh, at the beginning of the year, is you meet people from all different walks of life, all different mm. nations here in Thailand, you know, and you don't come to Thailand to live here, you know, with small goals, really, unless you're one of those like kind of hippie people trying to find themselves uh, <laughs> in, in Thailand. Many mm. of the people that you end up meeting here, uh, you know, they all have a story, you know, because mm. they're the people that didn't say, oh, man, it's a 12 hour flight. Oh, it's this far, or whatever it may, whatever excuse it may be. You know, mm. they whatever those excuses were, the people that are here, you know, they're mm. here for a reason. And mm. those are the types of people that, you know, kind of let those go to the side and they made it possible. So mm. uh, I think that's another reason why it's so easy to connect with people here. Mm. So why why did you decide to move to Thailand? Life is much simpler here. Life is very straightforward and I get to do mm. all of my passions and all that I love in one place and everything mm -hmm. makes sense. I, I don't spend minutes, hours or even minutes on anything that I'm not passionate about. Um, mm. You know, there's no people calling to ask for favors because I'm way out of reach. You know, we're on a 12 hour mm. time difference. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> if, <laughs> if something is important, you know, we'll make time to have mm -hmm. conversation, to hop on a call, whatever it may be. But unless it's not, you know, we we live our own lives and, and try to succeed ourselves. So being out here is, one, it's a lot cheaper. You know, it's, mm -hmm. living as a professional fighter, the fighting itself doesn't pay the bills. So, mm -hmm. on, so we're living in beautiful Chiang Mai, which is the northern region of Thailand. It is a very cheap area to live in uh, a mm -hmm. lot cheaper than living on the islands in the south and so we're able to live for a fraction of the price while working mm -hmm. while chasing you know these dreams and passions that aren't maybe a hundred percent there yet mm -hmm. but it, it's it, it makes it possible and then you're again just going back to what i was saying before you're surrounded by the same types of people and there's nothing mm -hmm. if you're doing the sport of muay thai there's nowhere in the world that's better than Thailand itself, you know, the, oh, yeah. the, the homeland of the sport. Being back mm. home, uh, you know, I'm in the gym, and yes, I get inspired <laughs> by Grandma Betsy that comes in and puts in the, her fucking 45 minutes on the bag, mm. and or she comes in for a private lesson with me. That inspires me as well. But I need people that are on my level that are willing mm. to push that extra mile and that don't have a full-time job doing something else you know a lot of the coaches back home they still have to work part-time jobs full-time jobs mm -hmm. on top of uh coaching you're not getting three hour sessions in twice a day mm. so you, you said that life was simpler can you explain that a little bit because like i'm i'm from belgium so for me it's hard to understand i think so think about it this way uh i back home i would I would wake up, I would have to take the dogs out, you know, check the mail, check mm -hmm. my emails, um, get dressed, get in my car, perhaps grab a coffee. That, that was always uh, the biggest plus, is, uh, you know, driving through a drive through at Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks. And <laughs> that, that, was, that was my piece. That was my piece for the day because that was the only time I got with myself and not working. So the only time I didn't work back home. Mm -hmm. the 30 minutes I got in the morning driving to the capital Hartford in Connecticut and then mm -hmm. a half hour drive back at the end of the night. Sometimes I'd sit in my car for an extra 15 minutes just breathing. Okay, all right, next session or mm -hmm. next client or next, uh, you know, cafe where I had to sit down on my computer. Mm -hmm. And though I work as many hours here, um, all the things in the middle, you know, like uh, as you're going through the session, okay, somebody calls, I need this favor. Um, you know, you open the mail, you have this obligation, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, family, friends, whatever it may be, you got to stop by EMV, you have to stop by uh, motor vehicle department, whatever it may be, go to the mall. You're worrying about things that you don't worry about here, meaning like, what? what I don't wear underwear here. You know, mm. like <laughs> I wake up in the, man, I, I wake up in the morning, I have my coffee. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I write. Sometimes I write. And then I go on my run. I train mm -hmm. for two to three hours. 
then the middle of the day is completely free mm -hmm. and i work the entire time pretty much but if we have nice weather we'll go trekking into the mountains you know exploring seeing the culture here in the city mm -hmm. um exploring nature outside of the city everything is within like a half hour distance on a motorbike um and then come back do it all over again you know another two to three hours of training uh grab food for a dollar a meal so you know the lady on the side of the road cooks it for mm. one dollar <laughs> and oh nice and you have and you have your meal and i get my full night of sleep you know i get my full eight eight and a half hours which i mm -hmm. would never do back home it's mm. just i had a lot more material things back home a mm -hmm. lot less time and i was making a lot less uh when when it came to uh, fulfillment happiness and mm -hmm. and even financially it's just mm. because of the expenses of living back home the time that it takes and uh the the things you worry about back home uh, mm. that you just don't worry about here everything is uh just free and and at the end of the day yeah, I, I get up at 6 a.m. every day. I go to bed at 10 p.m. every day. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I don't want to tomorrow, I have the option of not doing that. I never do, mm. but I always have the option of not, you know. Mm. So you, you mentioned that you used to drive around a lot. Like, how did you f focus on mindset when you were always on the go? I mean, that's part of it is uh, a lot of the times you like, maybe you got that one day where you would stop or uh, a lot of the training I did and I actually enjoyed doing is going to New Jersey, New York, those two, mm -hmm. three hour drives mm -hmm. because they gave me that piece. Uh, every week I would drive for at least two to three hours to New York or New Jersey. I did this even as an amateur. So I was going to college. I was working 20, 25 hours a week and I was training, driving mm -hmm. to New York, New Jersey, to cross train with the better athletes in mm. New York and New Jersey, these like different tri-state areas to get better work in. And also just to clear my mind, just to think, um, you know, at the time I was starting out my blog, went to athlete and uh, it was a lot of the time that I got to be alone just to think or, or it was a time for the team to kind of get together. If like four of us were on a drive, it was a uh, good camaraderie for, people to be in the car together for two, three hours, just joking, laughing. Then they get two, three hours of sparring and training in. And I if you really remember and uh, that build that team spirit and camaraderie. Mm. Something interesting that I heard as well is that you, you train like almost seven hours a day, something like that. Uh, yes, currently I'm training, I would say, I would say about five hours right now. Mm. Um, when I was living in Thailand before, I was, it was a different life uh, here. I, it's more on my terms. It's mm -hmm. more so I, I have a hired trainer. And then on top of it, I do the group sessions as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more so like from one side, I, uh, I'm a, I have a higher trainer and then I'm also in the group classes like most people do when they come to Thailand. Mm -hmm. But before I was living in the camp. So Nam Sak Noi is one of the greatest golden era fighters of all time. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much in the prime time of the huge stadiums here of Lumpini. And uh, he was undefeated for a number of years, six or seven years uh, long. Mm -hmm. One of the best fight records in the history of the stadium 285 wins 15 losses and when he opened his gym i was the first and i believe still the only western sponsored fighter um mm. i i lived i lived in the gym before it opened so mm. i was there with his family uh, it was just me and him there was another boy from Jap japan that didn't speak any english so it was just me and him uh sharing a bunk bed with a fan mm. living and living at the gym and before it opened, you know, spending time with his family. And that was a different life. That's, that's mm. where I was logging in around seven hours a day mm. for close to half a year. Oh, that nice. was my transition to the professional rankings. Uh, before I fought for lion fight and glory and, and the bigger promotions is that was my transition from 
being a high level amateur and transitioning into the professional rankings. Oh, how did you, how did you make sure that you re recovered all the way? Because that's a lot of training. You weren't. I never was. Uh, yeah, okay. I was about, uh, after the first two weeks, uh, I stayed around 50%, I would say. You know, there, there were some days where you felt really good. Mm -hmm. And you would get the morning in and you're like, man, I feel good today. It's Tuesday. And you're maybe at 70, 80 percent, which, which you would hope for. And then mm -hmm. by the afternoon, you're back. You know, if you pushed it too hard, then you would be back at like 30 by the afternoon. Ah, okay. There wasn't really much time, time in between. I stopped working altogether when I was doing this just to make it through the training sessions. Mm -hmm. um, not, not a lot of healthy habits. There was... Uh, a lot of painkillers, a lot of uh, stimulants, you know, mm. Red Bull, every single session, uh, a lot of caffeine, a lot of painkillers, a lot of uh, kind of grinding through the injuries, especially mm -hmm. uh, I fought three times within a, man, I want to say it was within like a month span, it might have mm -hmm. been. Uh, like 32 day span, something like that. I fought three times after not fighting for four months because I uh, fractured four bones in my face. You can kind of ah. see my nose. Is, you can oh, kind of yeah. see my face uneven. My nose is shifted here. Yeah. Uh, I had reconstructive surgery, but not until two mm. years after that. Um, mm. I actually had it this year because it just got to a really bad point. But um, yeah, when I was in the camp, it was just... Uh, after the first fight, uh, my shin was really bruised up. Uh, you know, I'm a southpaw, I'm a left kicker, and we don't utilize both the legs as much because the gap on that lead side is so close. The right kick isn't really viable. It's not really a good option. Mm -hmm. So um, it was something that he was worried about, but it's something that you, you – it's kind of like the seals. Like, you got to ring your own bell. Uh, they won't give you a way out, and you can't really ask – for ways out unless you mm -hmm. want to quit altogether. So I was on a contract and I could have been kicked out of the camp at any day. Mm -hmm. So it was more of a job. It was, it was no longer a hobby. It was no longer a passion. It was more so work as a fighter. Mm -hmm. So it was great for mental toughness. Mm. Yes, I, I would definitely say so. I think it's something that's grown me to be a completely <laughs> different man. Uh, for a long time, it was a negative thing. It was mm -hmm. something that made me lose my passion for the sport uh, in many of ways uh, because the injuries lingered around affecting me in the upcoming fights, and then it would make me bitter in a way. Mm -hmm. Whether I won or lost, I felt very bitter because I no longer enjoyed doing it, which is part of the process. Like Now, mm -hmm. now I have a lot of things to look back upon, I'm just speaking from the person I was at the time. At the time, mm -hmm. I just, I hated it. I hated my trainers. Uh, I hated what I was doing. I didn't want to do it anymore. But I've always had this uh, thing about me where if I sign up for something, and mm -hmm. even if it doesn't make any sense anymore, like uh, at the time, I had really bad staff in my knee. I was at antibiotics three times in a row through mm -hmm. the training camp. Then I was going into the third fight, and I had to do antibiotics again more painkillers, and then I knew my knee was pretty blown out. Um, there was something up with my knee after the staph infections were inside of my knee. And mm -hmm. it, I, like, running, uh, there was one day I, I, I'll always remember because I was running, and my knee just gave out, and I fell, and mm -hmm. my right hand was holding my cell phone. My cell phone shattered. My whole hand just got scraped and, like, blood. And I just got out. I'm like, what the f it's one of those moments you, where you ask yourself, you're like, why am I doing this? You know, mm. like, why am I doing this to myself? And uh, I, I had a month left and I kind of wanted to stop, but I, on contract, had a month left. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I signed on this dotted line and this is a choice that I made. So whether, you know, I'm sick, I have these infections, I have mm -hmm. a blown out knee, my hand is fucked and I'm about to fight in, you know, five days. I still signed up for this, so mm -hmm. I have to finish it. And, and I did, you know, I, I paid for it for a while after, but mm. I can always, uh, I can always tell myself and be at peace with myself for the rest of the time. Mm. Nice. 
does your uh, family pr pressure on you to go back to like the the normal life like you know settle down get some babies it's it's that time you know not anymore uh you know it, it was more of that pressure at the beginning until I, I think this process has actually helped my parents understand in a way where I think me logging it through my website showing mm. parts of my life obviously you can't put out everything that you go through and and be able to explain it unless you're someone that's lived it like I, mm -hmm. I'm sure if anyone's listening that's done anything extremely difficult in their life they can relate to this you know like mm -hmm. like one thing I've learned from this is that this translates to everything like when I'm learning more about business or different parts of my life the same process happens there's a bunch of fucking challenges there's downfalls like you know, if, if it's an injury in the physical space, as me as a professional fighter, there are things that are just as, uh, that affect you the same exact way when mm -hmm. you're learning and, and, and trying to, uh, to start a business, let's say, you know, like there are people that are going to maybe disappoint you, hurt mm -hmm. you. You're going to have to figure out different ways, you know, like you're going to lose at some point, maybe like whether it's money or opportunity or whatever it may be. And then, you have to ask yourself that why, like, why am I doing this in the first place? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these same questions arise. So um, I, th I think them seeing myself go through these different things, uh, especially in the beginning, they, when I had an injury, mm -hmm. let's say I broke my nose, I hurt my foot, I had knee surgery, or, you know, I had facial reconstruction, I had a number of surgeries. Uh, in the first one or two, they questioned it, like, like, is it worth it, man? But by like the second, third time, they see like, Okay, obviously, we're not going to change their mind. If he's going to quit, it's going to have to be on his own merit. We're not going to change his mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, the travel, uh, the the people I have met and the stories I featured through my site, through my conversations with with my family. And whenever we get back together as a family, you know, at the table, I mean, I'm everyone's the, asking me questions about my life. Mm -hmm versus speaking about their own. And I think they finally realized that I'm doing something that not many people are willing to do because it sucks and it's shitty, but it gives me an interesting story. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of it, they can respect and also the part of it of traveling and uh, learning about the world and its different cultures. My mother mm -hmm. has always been big on this. She's always told me not to have a single place to settle down and things like that before i'm like 30 years old she's like there's just so much to see and i think a lot of that is just unfulfilled wishes from uh you know people that see younger people and they want to pass down some of their knowledge is that you mm -hmm. know like if i never got to see the world uh, i definitely would want my children one day to mm -hmm. you know have even more experiences than i had have a, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of a smoother path but also have those hardships that you get by uh, traveling and seeing how other people, how bad other people have it. Mm. Yeah. Did you ever travel on your own? Yeah, very long. Um, you know, when I was at the Namsak Noi camp, I was by, like I said, I was there by myself. It was just mm -hmm. me and the Japanese boy for a couple months before the gym opened and people started rolling in. But they were there during the classes. Uh, after the classes, you know, people would go and do their parties or they would come for two weeks or they would come for a month. And, you know, they would want to have like a goodbye party or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. I was there for almost half a year. So, you know, I always had tomorrow. There was always tomorrow. There's always next week, next month. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really didn't have a chance to think about that. So once that finished, there was a lot of time that like uh, the third fight. Uh, I had a, my shin was purple, it was brown, it was black before the fight. Mm -hmm. And my instructor told me he's worried about me not left kicking because I was wearing a shin guard to kick during class. Mm -hmm. And I'd have a, I'd put a patch on it, like a pain patch, and mm -hmm. then I'd rub it with a hot towel and then ice it and, and, and painkillers and still put the shin guard on and kick with the shin guard on. Because he wouldn't let me fight unless I got my reps in, you know, like mm. however many hundred kicks on each side. And then he told me he was worried. And I, and I told him, you know, at first I kind of did it like as a 
like look how big my balls are kind of thing like mm-hmm. like oh no I, I you know my mind is too strong this this and that and then i kind of thought about it, like that's not what he wants to hear like how good i am he just wants to hear that uh you know it's not going to be something that's going to limit my mind like me thinking about my leg being injured instead mm. i went up to him and i and i told him I'm like listen i i understand you're worried about this it's my last fight i promise you i'm going to give everything i have and if this leg fails me you've been training me for the past six months and we've been training in the clinch we've been training all eight of our weapons like this is only one weapon you know, mm-hmm. I have I have seven other ways out of this. I have seven other ways to to win this fight. So just just trust me. And uh, mm-hmm. if you watch the fight back, you know, it's the entire fight is me left kicking. It's almost like I took it on as a challenge. <laughs> I took it on as a challenge. It it, it hurt. It hurt every mm-hmm. fucking time. But I would say out of like a hundred of the strikes I threw, I would say like there was like <clears> seventy <throat> left kicks that i threw in the fight all all three rounds i was just blasting the left kick almost like a like a fuck you like are you watching this because this is what i'm doing uh, yeah kind of a sadistic thing but uh once the fight was over i couldn't walk for a couple of days and and uh and my contract finally ran um mm-hmm. i had my visa ran out i was in thailand for nine months uh, my mm-hmm. visa ran out because uh, you can do a six month visa here that you can extend up to nine months and and then you got to get out of the country altogether. So I ended up getting the nine month visa and I had plans of going back home, but I didn't have the one way ticket home yet. So I started just traveling. Uh, I just I spent six weeks, like a month and a half without a plan. I just hmm. just me one bag. And uh, I spent some weekends here. I spent a weekend at my on my friend's uh floor i spent a weekend on rooftop you know five-star hotels in in Mm. bangkok and and then i traveled to bali and a number of other countries and then uh later that year i ended up going back to europe going to england going to poland a lot of that travel was on my own and i've always enjoyed that i feel like I, i i learned a lot about that and now it's actually made me appreciate the travel that I'm doing with my lady that much more. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, mean, I mean, talking about travel and driving and challenges, uh, how I met my girlfriend is I ended up driving to Florida from Connecticut. So if you think about the United States, I drove all the way from the top to the bottom, which is, okay. uh, it's a 24 hour drive. Mm-hmm. But I just didn't sleep. And I, I drove about, I want to say it's around 11 hours. And and I taught a seminar halfway through, mm-hmm. and and then uh, I pulled an all nighter and decided to surprise her and drive down to Florida, and that was a twenty four hour ride altogether. <laughs> Holy now, shit! And then nice. uh, and then when I came back home a couple of days later, I flew out to Thailand, hmm. m- moving back to Thailand. Yeah. Damn. Okay, so now. People always assume that dating becomes easier when you're ambitious. Like it's a lot of people. Well, this is this is uh, based on what I see in Belgium, of course. But like a lot of guys fake their ambitious side. You know, they they talk a lot. Like I want this, this, and this, because they assume that they'll attract more girls. But the reality, if you're really ambitious, is different. At, at least in my experience. Like, can you tell a little bit more about that? I think you're always going to find examples that will fulfill whatever you're looking for so you'll mm-hmm. always find the guy that is uh talking a lot that doesn't really do anything and he just wants to be liked um mm-hmm. and then you can also find see it in a positive and a negative light like you can see in a light that you know like this guy's an asshole is just trying to um you know reap the rewards of something that he's not mm-hmm. putting in the work for but at the same time you know maybe he sees the lifestyle and and he wants to feel good about himself and it's more of a story that he is telling himself mm-hmm. so maybe one day he, he can become that mm-hmm. you know and and then you also have the opposite you have the guys that are really quiet but they'll talk a lot in the background you know mm-hmm. like I, i've met a lot of people that 
you know, they're like, oh, he's just quiet and humble and, 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 you know, he bows to everyone and he's super mm -hmm. respectful. But like, every time I see him in a private situation, he's talking about another guy at the gym or in the camp or about this. And, and there's all different types of jealousy. So he stays qu quiet because he's really loud and, and behind closed mm -hmm. doors. I've had opponents like that, the, the same exact <clears throat> way. I've had guys that talk really, really loud. And then after, after I beat them, after they talked all the shit that I beat them, they came up to me and, and shook my hand, apologizing, saying, I'm sorry, man. You know, like, this is all part of the entertainment. I was just trying to talk myself up. I knew how uh, talented of a fighter you were. I was mm -hmm. psyching myself up. Like, I actually love what you do here and here. And it comes out that, you know, they, they're actually a fan in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and they're a good person, you know? And then I've had the the opposite like i said like i've had the guy that's that was quiet and he shakes my hand but then i listen to to uh an interview an article or i just hear from the background that like after i beat him he's just talking shit he's just still talking shit that you know oh, like no. oh it's because of this reason making things up so when it comes to ambition uh i think time just kind of weeds it out you, you can tell mm. you know like I, I have friends i have people that are close to me that i i love that i know you know post it on instagram on facebook but i see them in the gym mm. and i know that their friend grabbed their camera for that 20 seconds that they go ah, ah and then they <laughs> walk out of the gym tw you know five minutes later right like they, they, uh -huh. they made sure to take their picture they made sure to go hard on the pads when the video was around but then the the you know the rest of the time they they're not really putting in the work. So, but but then again, uh, that shows. Uh, one thing you can't lie about is fighting. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's a saying a lot of people talk about is like you can't fake comedy being funny because no one will laugh. You know, and mm -hmm. and you can't fake fighting either. Um, once you get in the ring, it shows who the better prepared martial artist is. So, mm -hmm. I'm. I'm I'm always ready. I'm always prepared. So I think my ambition shows there because I always fight until the last bell. But then at the same time, uh, you know, I've had fights where I stayed really quiet. And uh, it was because I was trying to, like, really focus on myself. And, and, and sometimes I stayed quiet because I was trying to fulfill what other people wanted me to meaning uh mm. you know people want to see me as someone that's humble and and and, and bowing to everything mm -hmm. and everyone when uh that that maybe that's not what i needed in that situation and mm -hmm. at the end of the day when we're going in there to to get hit in the face and you know there's a possibility of being seriously injured or receiving brain trauma i i don't judge anyone for what they mm -hmm. say what they do before a fight maybe you can judge them after a fight you know how they mm -hmm. win how they lose that's fine with me but um you know whatever gets you ready in that state where you're the best version of yourself when you're in that ring uh it's all fair game mm -hmm. yeah mm. so but what um what I actually meant was like i've had this like this has happened to me like there was a girl i went to date her and she was like yeah but you don't have your shit together and i was like how do you mean and she was like you have zero ambition in life because you don't take your job seriously. And I was like, this is interesting. You know, like, how did, how did, did how did the ambition affect your life? Maybe life in general, but dating life as well. I guess you just have to be a little bit more specific when it, when it comes to like what the, what the definition is. And like if someone were to say that to me, um, like, oh, you're not ambitious enough, let's say, uh, you have to ask, you know, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Like what place is this person in? Maybe that person is extremely ambitious. If, if the person is not, then what is the opinion of a peon anyways, you know, mm -hmm. when, when, when maybe you internally have your shit together. And then also if it offends you, Maybe at the same mm. time you have to look a little bit further in of mm. you know why 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 does it offend? Because it can offend you for one of two ways. Like uh, it offends me because I put in work and you're not seeing mm -hmm. it. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, or it can be because like oh shit, I don't want you to think that. Maybe I am, but I'm gonna ignore that for now, whether I am or not. I just mm -hmm. don't want you to 
think it this way or make it out to be that way for other people to hear as well or for people to think that way about me. But at the end of the day, you have to look into what you can control, like whether it's your thoughts mm -hmm. or, you know, your answer to that type of question. And asking why and asking questions back a lot of the time kind of clears things up is like repeating mm -hmm. it back, back to the person. They kind of realize how they said something. Maybe they don't even realize it. You know, we all have like different thoughts in our heads. Mm -hmm. you know, something <laughs> shoots out of our mouth, but they don't mm -hmm. hear the, you know, five minute conversation inside our head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all have a different way of viewing the world. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you deal with uh, the pressure? Because like, there's a lot of outside pressure when you try to achieve things, but there's also a lot of yeah, pressure on yourself. You know what I mean? Like if things don't work out, like how do you keep the perfect balance? Because if you stress out, you can yeah, get sick or get, get behind on training and work. I've always had a really good work ethic and I think that really helped with my confidence and especially in the beginning I was almost ignorant to, mm -hmm. to the fact that I that I can fail uh, um, I, I was lucky to start out with a, a lot of wins so I kind of got momentum going mm -hmm. and the the pressure was there however I, I I was overly confident in a way and I feel like I won a lot of the fights just because the other guys were still thinking when they were in the ring, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at a low level of, of sports, there's, there's guys that just do shit. And then there's mm -hmm. guys that are thinking about the movements of making them good. So there's a lot of guys that didn't have the ring experience. that had a lot more years of experience training, mm -hmm. but, uh, they would get in the ring and, you know, their technique would look better. They look prettier than I did. Mm -hmm. And, but I was fighting in backyards and I was sparring really, really hard in the beginning. Not something I would advise doing, but <laughs> I thought that's, I really thought that's what fighting was, is I mm -hmm. was really ignorant to mm -hmm. what fighting is. I didn't, I, it wasn't sport to me. It was a fighting. fight. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm trying to hurt you. I'm not thinking about mm -hmm. like whether this jab is going to land or not. I'm just making sure you don't hit me and I'm going to hurt you. So it, it was more of a, it, it was a very amateurish way of looking at it, but it was really something that gave me a lot of momentum in the beginning while guys are still figuring out, you know, mm -hmm. when to use certain techniques while they're thinking, I was just there to fucking win, you know, to, to hurt you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, now that's uh, completely changed. So over, over time, how you deal with pressure changes. And, and in the beginning, it, it was more of an ignorance than... Uh, over time, it, it became something that um, I wanted to prove to other people, mm -hmm. and um, a lot. Of, so a lot of it just keeps going back to that why as well. Mm -hmm. Is you know, like in the beginning, it's like why am I doing this? I was like, oh, okay, so I can maybe be more confident. I can feel tough. Whatever the reasons were, it's mm -hmm. so long ago. I can't even reminisce on those moments you know mm -hmm. it feels like a different lifetime ago now but then going into it, i remember going to the parts like uh just trying to prove others wrong like kind of what you're talking about like pressure from parents uh mm -hmm. telling me like you know like there's no way to make anything of this it's not gonna amount to anything mm -hmm. uh your opponents thinking you're the guy getting brought in to lose that would fuel me and help me deal with the pressure uh, I was always taking on opponents that had more experience. They had more fights. They were supposed to beat me. So mm. the pressure was on like me getting beat up. But I saw it the other way. Like, uh, you know, some people feel nervous. Like, oh, my God, this guy's so good. In mm -hmm. my head, it was I got nothing to lose. If I lose to him, he's supposed to beat me already. Yeah. But if I win, I mean, to me, the pressure is on this guy. Not really mm -hmm. for me. Like, I have nothing to lose. I'm just here to win and to mm. prove you guys wrong. Um, and then over time, once you reach the professional ranks, that's where it gets really tough because there's so many more factors now. Uh, there's money mm -hmm. involved. Uh, when people ask you to fight, are they asking you to fight for experience? Are they trying to build you up? Are they bringing you in to lose for this guy? And mm -hmm. are they paying you this much? 
to lose? Are they paying you less so they can build you up? There's a lot more factors. And that's mm. where it's definitely gotten the hardest. Uh, so because I started to kind of lose my why. Uh, you know, it's always been because of passion uh, for wanting to inspire others to mm -hmm. to feel a sense of fulfillment myself, to challenge myself, to really see how far I can take it. And then all these different factors started piling in and uh, it kind of detracted from art, the passion, the love itself. And that's what I've kind of spent this past year contemplating and working out. So I think a uh, blessing in the skies has been these injury, recent injuries I've had. I broke my hand, uh, my last fight for glory kickboxing, mm -hmm. and it's given me a lot of time to really reflect upon all of it and, mm -hmm. and kind of see patterns of, you know, when did I let the pressure affect me? When did I not? And kind of taking note and, you know, uh, you, you don't really know how well you deal with pressure unless you put yourself in those situations. Mm. So, you know, if you're someone starting out, you, you can't perfect everything before you do it because you have to find out how you're going to handle it, you know, and then you, you can imp then you can improvise on the spot. And then after you can look back on it. OK, I really didn't deal with that. Well, that's what I got to change. But then you have to let it go at the same time going into the next one because you can't let it uh, mm. get, to your, get to your head either. Yeah. But after 30, you know, like you might not get it right for a second, third, fourth time. Once you have 40 fights, um, you know, I'm, I'm reaching around that point now. Because, oh. You know, my overall record being around 40, um, I'm, I'm able to look back and say, OK, whenever I was doing this, this was a good thing for me. Whenever I was doing that, that wasn't such a good thing for me. When I surrounded myself with these types of people, you start to see patterns and correlations. Mm. And then you can make, make more of an objective thing, not an emotional thing. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so yesterday I, um, I went for a cold swim. Like I do, I do the Wim Hof method from time to time. It's, it's okay. fun, yeah. And uh, I posted on Instagram and I posted like a long winded post about the fact that people think that I do it like, for me, it's like something natural to me. But I, I talked about the fact that every time I, I stand in front of the water, I doubt myself. I compare it even to, to hard sparring, I do MMA, uh, because I always doubt myself before. But as soon as it's time to go, it's like I go in a, a peaceful state of mind, you know. Yeah. And my mm -hmm. question was, do you doubt, doubt yourself from time to time? But because there are a lot of things in life that aren't like set in stone, if you know what I mean. I think my doubts have always been camouflaged in a way. Uh, I, I'm someone that is big on details and aesthetics and, mm -hmm. and I look at some factors that are different than most people would like i don't just sit there and think like win or lose uh mm -hmm. a lot of my first i would say my first like eight fights my biggest worries and pressures are that it's not gonna look pretty like technical because my first couple mm. fights they were so so raw you know like i won the fights but they were so raw you know like throwing just hard punches and uh, mm. I, I had an okay <laughs> clinch game so that was okay but i just didn't look as pretty I, w I would watch these professional high level fighters and i would see how smooth and beautiful they just make mm. this movement look and i didn't look that same way and mm -hmm. uh in my head it was embarrassing when when you know the general public they can't tell whether a jab is perfect or not perfect yeah. when it, they just care whether it lands or it doesn't land you know mm. Uh, but but to me, that's not what I cared about. I cared about looking, I, I would rather lose looking really good and technical and putting a good example forward of Muay Thai, of kickboxing, whatever the art was at the time. Mm -hmm. I boxed as well. So just looking like a good boxer as a boxer, be looking at a good kickboxer as a kickboxer, Muay Thai fighter as a Thai fighter. And that was the pressure I kind of put on myself. I would watch the fight back. I didn't even care about the win or loss. I would just mm -hmm. say, oh, man, like, I look so stiff doing this or mm -hmm. like th that looks really ugly. And, you know, th that was more of the pressure um, that I was putting on myself. So did I, d I, I would doubt myself in, in those senses, like, like, 
Mm. Am I going to look like I look like in training, you know, like as, mm. as I'm putting all this work in? And then more recently, uh, while fighting for glory, it was more so the doubt would be, it's a weird thing because I'm, I love and I'm very passionate about the sport of Muay Thai because of the culture that surrounds it. When I see kickboxing as more of a, like this, just sport, you know, like it just competition. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not. I'm not as involved in its culture and people and uh, everything that comes with it because it doesn't have as much tradition, you know, mm. within the sport. And uh, it is just competition, and 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 I love competition, but my doubt would be, uh, you know, will will my style be complemented mm. here? You know, like are these people going to appreciate me? as a fighter and and what i'm capable of and whatever it may be and and also uh doubting my injuries that that's definitely been something i've been overcoming this this past year is you know mm. trusting my knee trusting mm. my uh hand trusting different <clears throat> injuries from the past so the doubt sets in um but now i know my why mm. and i think a lot of people you know, they, they use religion, you know, mm -hmm. uh, God, you know, God, uh, well, that, it's yeah. up to God, you know, like we, we've mm -hmm. done is the training and it's up to God. Uh, I'm, I'm not as religious. So mm -hmm. to, to me, that doesn't work because I don't believe it, you know, like for something to work, I feel like I have to feel it right here in my chest. Mm -hmm. So before I walk out, I, I haven't really had a feeling in my chest the, the, in the past year or so. And mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I'm just now finding it. Mm. Uh, it, it that, 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 it's, that it's coming in, you know, like I had my reasons why, and they've changed many times over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, since I started kick, since I started kickboxing, I haven't had it. And mm -hmm. uh, now I've found it, whether it's boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, uh, the reason is no longer attached to the sport or what I'm doing. It's more so attached to myself. Mm. So is this a the defining year for you, like in 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 terms of personal growth? And it's 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 never complete. So who knows? Like maybe next year mm. is the year. Maybe, but but mm. uh, you know, I'm I'm sure as hell doing everything I can right now to make the mm. biggest changes that I can. Uh, it feels like I am. You know, mm. I, I've, I've had those moments before, but, you know, every step you take, it, it's like a technique. I watched mm. myself from a month ago and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing right here? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm very critical of myself. I video every one of my training sessions. So I watch mm. every single pad session. I watch every, uh, as much as I can on the bag or sparring and I watch it back. I watch it, everything mm. back. And uh, I critique myself, and then next month, hopefully, I look better. So, in a way, it's good, but I'm always looking back on myself. I'm like, what the fuck was I doing, like, uh, a month ago? So, it's the same thing when it comes to the mind. I, I think, why was I thinking this, like, a month ago? Like, why didn't I just let go of that thought and, and just flow, you know? Like, why, why mm -hmm. was I doubting myself because of this like it never mattered you know like mm. all these things that we make up to be so big in our head they don't matter that much like like oh my god if i if i do this extra run is it going to make that uh much of a difference like like whatever mental win you can get over yourself i think mm. is a good rep you know like mm. over overthinking too many things whether you take this fight or not like i'm not thinking about you know whether it was a good choice to take this fight that i took even last year it, like mm. that that fight doesn't matter anymore mm. that this next fight matters yeah the next thing and, and then this next fight's not gonna matter soon either yeah it's just there yeah exactly how how, how do you how do you deal with with failure and the the, the, uh, the things coming up after failure because like this year I set three goals for myself. They were like, I could have achieved them all, but I didn't achieve any of them. And I uh, realized this like last week. So last week was a week of a lot of reflection because it really sucked in the beginning, but now I got over it. But like, how do you deal with, with failure 
the feelings after the kind of depressed mood did you feel like a did you feel depressed like you're going to kind of sick and uh sit there and soak in it or did you feel kind of a kick in the ass and then was, you sat there and, and then busted out like four hours straight of whatever you're procrastinating on it was more like so i got sick um and then i got a breakup and then i got more sick so and that's the the, the, the week where i got more sick is a week where i had to reflect because i couldn't train i did block of course uh i could focus more on the block so that helped me a lot but it was like more frustration you know like fuck i didn't achieve anything well personal growth but i couldn't see it then i was more focused on i missed out on this it's fuel and it's only fuel if you use it like it's, yeah. it's cool if someone delivers it to your door but and it, and it just sits there unless, unless you throw in the fucking fire but but sometimes it's like the fire is you know, there's barely a spark there. So mm. I felt that uh, more recently because in the past when I failed, it was more like, uh, all right, motherfucker, let, let's step it up to the next level. And, mm. and to be, I was angry with myself and for not doing X, Y, and Z. You mm -hmm. know, everything's always uh, 2020 vision looking back, but looking forward, I go, okay, okay, all right. What can I do about this? Because it's gone, it's done and over mm -hmm. with. The only thing I can control is how I prepare for the next one and how I change these things. And I was able to do that. So more recently, that feeling never came. So I, would, I lost the fight and I, and I went, man, I fucking did everything I can and I gave it all I had. And I think it became harder once the reward system got really fucked up. Mm -hmm. Meaning in the past, if I failed and I tra trained harder and did more and I did everything I was supposed to do to the point that I'm sacrificing uh, relationships, sacrificing finances, mm -hmm. money, whatever it may be, and, and putting myself in as much pain as possible physically, mentally, it would pay off and it would pay off. Okay. All right, man. Then you can say at the end of the day, like, fuck, all right. You know, it sucked, but at least it was worth it. At the end of the day, I have this title in my hand. Mm. Uh, more, more recently, it's it's been the opposite. Like, fuck, I put in all this work and then I fail. Okay, get back on the horse. Let's keep going. Let's keep mm -hmm. grinding this out. Um, let's sacrifice more money, you know? Mm. So, like, dip more into the bank account. Uh, let's get better trainers. Let's do better mm. with nutrition. Um, and, and all these things. And I was always looking more like externally, like, uh, I need a different trainer. Um, I need to put in more hours. I need to put in more miles on the road. I need to mm. eat even better. Uh, I need to, you know, I started running double the miles. I started putting in double mm. the work and, uh, started spending double the money on the training camp. Mm. And, and then first round crack land, the, uh, left hand snaps first round. Fuck, man. Like, mm -hmm. all that work. First round, arm snaps. Um, you know, continue to finish the fight. Like, please, God, fucking just give me this, please. Like, mm -hmm. everything I put into this, right? Split decision, opposite corner. Mm -hmm. What the fuck, man? Like, mm -hmm. three times in a row, you know, I put in the work. And, and by just a hair, man, just by just a hair, you know, the other person. Mm -hmm. And I know the other person doesn't put in as much work. It, mm. Because it's impossible. I, I know the types of commitments that they have, right? Mm. And, and I know their friends, you know, like it's a small world here. And I know they're not putting in as many hours. I know they're not sacrificing as much money. Um, while I'm here, like, this is my life. This is all that mm. I'm doing. So uh, then that's where it became really frustrating. But it was also a lesson that. It's not always about the external things like how many miles you put on the road, whether you put in eight miles a day or five miles a day, uh, whether it's you put in 150 kicks on the bag or 200 kicks on the bag. Mm. Sometimes it's when you break that hand, why are you going to keep going? And, mm. and, and 
trying to figure out why you're supposed to win this, why you're there in the first place, and why it's worth breaking your hand and smashing it over and over again, which I did because it's ingrained in me not to give up. But it wasn't ingrained in me to win it. Mm. You know? But uh, the, the why was strong enough to to hit the motherfucker again with a broken hand to the point that I started tearing up ligaments and, and tendons in my hand. But it wasn't strong enough to the point where I'm clear-headed, like mm-hmm. cool with it, to the point where I go, okay, why don't I just switch to orthodox and start smashing the right hand? Because that's mm. open. Instead, it was uh, frustration. Like, all this work, broken hand. No one is here for me because my corner wasn't helping me as much as I'd like them to. They weren't giving me the advice I needed. I'm like, man, my hand is broken. What do you want me to do? They're like, throw this. When I was throwing what they were telling me, I was getting caught. So mm. then I felt like I was in there alone. And then I was just frustrated. So mm. I, it just became a battle of like, oh, you hit me. I hit you. And I let the less skilled fighter take me to a place of not a skilled fight, but more of a brawl. And, mm. and, you know, and, and then it's up, you know, it's, it's always a gamble when it's a brawl. Like, like, do you like the way I hit him or do you like the way he hit me? Mm. And the split decision said they like the way he hit me in, in those brawls. Mm. So, um, yeah, so if you can't find it outside, uh, usually mm. it's those lessons are inside Mm. nice okay thanks man Uh, we're going to keep it at this so where can people find you social media facebook uh youtube all of the above on uh muay thai athlete m-u-a-y-t-h-a-i athlete uh, muay thai athlete.com you have instagram at muay thai athlete you have youtube I've been with the athlete. I'm sure it'll show up, even though it's mm-hmm. under my real name, uh, Paul Pinashik. And then we also have Neck Moy Nation, yes. which is where I am a creator for uh, me, Sean Fagan, Lawrence Kenshin, Sylvie. We have had some guest coaches on there before, like Tiffany Van Soost, Chris Malseri, a number of professional fighters. And um, I'm, I'm becoming a much bigger part in it. So I'm adding a lot more content to that. So that's mm. been really my main focus is Nakamoy Nation. So you can head over to NakamoyNation.com. There's, you know, free trials on there if you just want to check out the website. Uh, it's an online academy that we have all created as, uh, you know, the top Muay Thai content creators. And, yeah, Muay Thai Guys podcast. We have a podcast ourselves. Yeah, that's great. Sean Fagan, where, where we talk about – kind of mindset for like 90 percent of the time yeah. <laughs> uh though we, though we have a lot of a number of times we bring on uh some really great guests we've had sylvie mm. on there a number of times some high level fighters um next week we're actually going to have a we've had some inspirational stories on there man like uh we had coach jeff smith who is about 65 years is in his mid 60s fighting professional boxing kickboxing oh. Uh, next, next week, we're going to have a fighter from England on Dom. He had his first fight. He just won his debut after losing over 100 pounds. So, uh, yeah, just just inspiring stories. And that's what we're searching for and trying to put out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely check out Nakamura Nation. The site is great. I liked your last video, by the way, with the boxing glove, the footwork. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, that's what I mean is uh, we're, we're trying to add on and uh me working through the injury i've done a lot of study when it comes to video photo and and production Mm. yeah all right thanks man thank you so much brother